Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis one more time, continuing our great series of pulmonology. In the previous video, we started talking about pulmonary embolism. Today, we'll talk about how to treat this ugly disease. With that being said, now let's get started. So, treatment of PE consists of four things. Supportive therapy, anticoagulant therapy, fibrinolytic therapy, and surgery is last resort. Supportive for everyone. Everyone gets a pony. In any emergency situation, you check your ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, then oxygen to everybody, IV fluids, especially if there's hypotension, dobutamine, especially if there is bradycardia. Next, we have anticoagulant therapy, unless contraindicated, heparin first, and then warfarin, but you start with heparin, this is called heparin bridge, until warfarin kicks into gear. Factor 10A inhibitors or direct thrombin inhibitors. Fibrin oletic, the famous TPA, especially if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, such as massive PE. Again, unless contraindicated, there are absolute contraindications and relative contraindications to TPA. Altoprase, ritoplase, tenecteplase, all of these are fancy name for tissue plasminogen activator. Surgery thrombectomy or embolectomy or thromboembolectomy performed by an interventional radiologist a person who makes bazillions of dollars ivc filter for prophylaxis in case of recurrent pe etc if it's pulmonary embolism give heparin if it's massive pulmonary embolism or saddle embolus give tpa what do you mean by massive i mean hemodynamically unstable such as hypotension, hypoxemia, severe bradycardia, etc. First, the supportive therapy. If there is hypoxia, give oxygen. If there is hypotension, give the IV bolus fluid. If there is bradycardia, give dobutamine to make your heart pumps stronger. <coughs> Second, anticoagulant therapy. We have heparin, we have warfarin, we have others. Heparin, we have two types, unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin, such as enoxaparin, deltaparin, tenzaparin, these are low molecular weight heparins. Warfarin is next, but you have to give heparin first, called the heparin bridge, because in the beginning, warfarin is pro-coagulation. Can you believe it? Others, such as factor 10A inhibitors, such as fendiparinox, apixaban, rivaroxaban, and look at this, 10A inhibitor, they have the X, because it's Roman numeral. Apixaban, XA, so this is the active factor 10, and ban because it's an inhibitor, and rivaroxaban. Who said pharmacology is difficult? Like, the name has the freaking answer. Direct thrombin inhibitor, they will have the word thrombo, thromb, something like that. Dabigatran, tran for me sounds like thrombin. Argatroban, thrombin ban. Again, the treatment of PE, supportive anticoagulant fibrinolytic and surgery. Once you suspect or confirm pulmonary embolism, you anticoagulate right away. Don't be super sophisticated and wait for fancy labs. Just go ahead and save the patient's life. Which drug should I give first? Heparin first, baby. You can use fundaparinox as well. Or maybe a direct thrombin inhibitor, but we start with heparin. Why? Rapid acting. Heparin is fast acting because it stimulates antithrombin 3. So, antithrombin 3 is the actual hero. Heparin just takes all the credit. What does antithrombin 3 do? It inactivates the serine proteases such as factors 9, 10, 11, and 12. How about we give warfarin first? Just shut up. There are two major problems of warfarin. Number one, it's very slow acting because you take it orally and then it has to go to the liver. Knock on the liver door. Then ask the liver to stop the habit of gamma carboxylation, which is vitamin K dependent. Then the liver will eliminate its production of vitamin K dependent serine protease, which are coagulation factors, protein C, protein S, factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. So you have to ask for permission from the liver first, and the liver will say, you know what, I'm just in the process of creating some of them, I will secrete them anyway, and then in the next cycle, okay, I will stop making them. Until you do this, the patient is dead. The second problem with warfarin is that it inhibits protein C and S before it inhibits factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Protein C and protein S are anticoagulation. Factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 are pro-coagulation. When you inhibit protein C and S, the anticoagulants, first, you are actually pro-coagulation in the beginning. 
so the patient can die from a thrombus, you doofus. And that's why warfarin causes warfarin skin necrosis. So what is the solution? The heparin bridge, you start heparin first. Okay, and you can give warfarin at the same time, but you have to start heparin, baby. And then warfarin is gonna be pro-coagulation in the beginning. Oh, what should I do? Heparin is gonna cover that, don't worry. And then warfarin is gonna kick into gear and become anti-coagulation. When warfarin becomes anti-coagulation, you can discontinue the heparin and continue with warfarin. So what's the problem with starting with warfarin? Two problems. One, the patient is literally dying and you have the audacity to give a slow acting oral drug. Two, the patient is having a clot and you are giving him a pro-coagulant, at least in the beginning. You are an idiot. If you do not start with heparin bridge, bridge with heparin, heparin first, and you can give warfarin for four days, then stop the heparin and continue warfarin alone. Heparin will anticoagulate until warfarin can stop being procoagulant and start being anticoagulant, which takes about four days. How should I know that warfarin is start working as anticoagulant? Something called the INR. When it reaches two, it's time to stop the heparin and rely on warfarin because the normal INR is 0.8 to 1.2. If it reaches two, it means you are anticoagulating, which is exactly what we want. Once you suspect or confirm pulmonary embolism, you anticoagulate right away. Don't wait for fancy labs. What are the contraindications to anticoagulation with heparin and warfarin? Major bleeding diathesis. That's not correct. Example, hemophilia, thrombocytopenia, thrombasthenia, liver failure, renal failure. Next, active bleeding disorder such as active GI bleed or peptic ulcer disease, cerebral aneurysm, dissecting aortic aneurysm, esophageal varices, recent surgery, recent stroke, recent trauma, severe uncontrolled hypertension, also known as malignant hypertension, which means systolic is greater than 200, diastolic is greater than 140 or equal. What are the contraindications to heparin? All of the above plus history of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or HIT, severe thrombocytopenia, life-threatening allergy to heparin, uncontrolled active bleeding except DIC. DIC is an uncontrolled active bleeding that needs heparin. What are the contraindications to warfarin? All of the above plus life-threatening allergy to warfarin, pregnancy because warfarin is a freaking teratogenic, and cancer, we do not prefer to give warfarin to cancer patients. So what should I do if I want to anticoagulate a cancer patient? Use low molecular weight heparin. Contraindications to TPA, we have absolute contraindications or relative contraindications. This is not an anticoagulant, this is a fibrinolytic. And I've talked about these contraindications before in my video about TPA, please watch it. Which one is better? Unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin? It depends. For DVT, low molecular weight is better. For PE, they are the same. If you are afraid of the risk of bleeding, low molecular weight is actually better for you because it has less bleeding risk. If you want to reach that therapeutic level faster, give low, low molecular weight. Which one can be monitored by PTT? Only the unfractionated heparin, not the low molecular one. Which one can cause HIT, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia? Both, but it's more common with unfractionated heparin. Which one has a higher risk of causing osteoporosis? Unfractionated. Which one is better for pregnant women? Low molecular weight. Which one is better for cancer patient? Low molecular weight. Which one is preferred? In case of renal failure, unfractionated heparin because low molecular weight is bad for your kidney. Which one is better in a pulmonary embolism patient who is hemodynamically unstable? Unfractionated heparin. Low molecular weight heparin has a relatively delayed onset. If the patient is dying right now and he's hemodynamically unstable, there is no time to waste. Give unfractionated heparin immediately, it has a rapid onset. Low molecular weight can take up to 30 minutes and now the patient is history. There is another problem with low molecular weight. It requires optimal blood pressure and adequate perfusion. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, translation, he has hypotension and inadequate perfusion, low molecular weight is just useless. How about the unfractionated heparin? It doesn't care about your hemodynamic stuff. 
it just binds to antithrombin 3 and activate antithrombin 3 to inactivate factors 9, 10, 11, and 12, no matter what. It doesn't give a hoot. Once you suspect PE, once you confirm the diagnosis of PE, you anticoagulate right away, don't wait for fancy tests. But my patient has contraindications to heparin. Example, recent hemorrhagic stroke. What shall I do? Thrombectomy or embolectomy. Thrombectomy to remove the thrombus, embolectomy to remove the embolus. Or you can put an IVC filter if it's not that urgent. But if it's a massive PE and the patient is hemodynamically unstable, don't talk to me about filters now. Just save the patient's life. What if I gave too much heparin? Give the antidote to heparin. It's called protamine sulfate. What if my heparin caused heparin-induced thrombocytopenia? So, I gave the patient heparin and it resolved and it prevented the PE from getting worse and saved his lives. Fine. And then several days later, the platelets are 20,000. Oops! And the patient is clotting. Wow. I give him heparin to anticoagulate, and then he is actually coagulating. What the flip is going on? Heparin caused heparin induced thrombocytopenia or HIT. So, do not give unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin in a patient with a history of HIT. Do give a direct thrombin inhibitor such as ergotiroban or lipuridine. Unless the patient has renal failure, in this case, do not give lipuridine, just give ergotiroban. Ergotiroban, it bans thrombin. Thrombin inhibitor. Can I give warfarin to a patient with HIT? Yes, but you have to wait until the platelets rise from, let's say, 20,000, which is dismal and horrible, to above 100,000. And then you can give warfarin. What if the platelets are only 30,000? Can I give warfarin? Shut up. So what should I do? Give Argatroban or Lepiridine. Once you suspect PE or confirm PE, you treat right away. Think of your ABCs. Give heparin. Give warfarin, but you have to start with heparin. It's called the heparin bridge for at least four days until the INR reaches at least two. If it's massive PE with hemodynamic instability, give TPA or any fibrinolytic. What are the indications for the IVC filter? Recurrent venous thromboembolism despite adequate anticoagulation or recurrent venous thromboembolism and the patient has contraindications to anticoagulant so you cannot anticoagulate what should i do put the ferrikin filter but for you to put the filter it has to be recurrent if this is the first time the patient gets a dvt or pe do not talk about the ivc filter otherwise you're just a greedy son of a bleep my favorite part of the lecture. Every point here is an exam question. Furcose triad increase your venous or arterial thrombosis risk. What is the Furcose triad? A triad of blood stasis, endothelial damage, and hypercoagulability. Polycythemia vera can increase your risk of thrombosis. Polycythemia vera is a myeloproliferative neoplasm. Paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria can increase your risk of DBT or PE. And PNH is a hemolytic anemia. PE is the most common preventable cause of death in hospitalized patients due to lack of prophylaxis. Oh, this patient is having DVT. His right calf is very painful. Should I wait until he becomes short of breath with pleuritic chest pain, coughs up blood and start having fever? Shut up! Just give heparin right away. It's called prophylaxis. Pulmonary embolism is the third most common cardiovascular cause of death. Number one is ischemic heart disease. Number two is stroke. The most common site of thrombosis in DVT is deep vein of the leg. The most common site of embolization is the femoral vein. One in every 10 patients with PE die within the first hour. Act quickly, guys. The WELLS criteria for DVT or PE determine the pre-test probability. If WELLS criteria show low probability of PE and if the VQ scan yields low probability, you have successfully ruled out PE. Should I go ahead and order the invasive pulmonary angiography? Shut up, you have successfully ruled out the disease with the clinical criteria called WELLS with a negative VQ scan. Don't waste money. Don't waste resources in a world 
with scarce resources which have alternative uses. It's called economics. And rule number one in economics is scarcity. There is never enough of anything to fully satisfy all those who want it. So, leave the pulmonary and geography to patients whose life actually depend on it, not just to everybody who walks in. If the patient is at risk of bleeding and you want to give heparin, give heparin as an infusion so you can shut it off at any time. Infusions like this, like an IV drip, 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 and then when you're sick and tired of it, just close the valve. Or push a button. Or use your touch ID, I don't know. From the paradox and the mnemonic of the X. X is adversarial. X means like A versus B. So X, like they hate each other. It's factor 10A inhibitor. It hates everything. It's adversarial. No active factor. Does not cause hit. There is no hit with from the paradox. It's contraindicated renal failure. No use in renal failure. And it has no freaking antidote. Regarding pulmonary embolism, there are a lot of myths in the culture that I would like to debunk. Number one, chest x-ray can diagnose PE. Shut up, it cannot. EKG can diagnose PE. It cannot. Aspirin can treat PE. Shut up, aspirin can prevent some clots, like if it did, but it cannot treat an actual clot that's happening right now. We should give warfarin first. No, heparin first. It's called the heparin bridge. What if I give warfarin first? It's procoagulant in the beginning and the patient can end up with skin necrosis and die from his clot. Shut up. TPA can be used for hemodynamically stable PE. Again, we live in the world of scarce resources. Only if the patient has hemodynamic instability. Only the unfractionated heparin can cause heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Low molecular weight heparin can never do this. Just shut up. Both of them can lead to hit. Sorry that I'm yelling at you. I want you to be the best doctors ever. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and smash like. Follow me on Facebook. I have 100 cases there. You can get the notes of this video and every other video. I have some premium videos. I have cases. I have post notes. I have PDF notes. They are organized by subject in great clean Dropbox folders. Just go to patreon.com slash medicosis. Thank you so much for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfect Nails, where medicine makes perfect sense.